Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar by Morelical, where we will be showing you some tools and methods we use at Morelical to make quality control for our BIM models. We will try to feed this webinar in 50 minutes, and uh, we will have 10 minutes in the end for questions and answers that you can post on the chat. My name is Ignacio Suke. I'm an architect and BIM specialist from Modelical, and I am based in Barcelona. Here with me is Andres. Andres. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Andres. I'm an architect at Modelical, uh, in this case, in the Madrid office. So, welcome everyone from Madrid, and uh, thank you for joining. Okay, so we're gonna start this webinar with a famous image. Um, this image that some of you might recognize, it's a slogan from 1995 from the advertising agency Young and Robicam, who launched the uh, Pirelli uh, advertising campaign, and it was a very successful campaign. And I couldn't agree with, more with the slogan, that's why I put it over here, because if we transfer this analogy to the AEC sector, we will agree that BIM is a very powerful methodology, but it needs control. Otherwise, power is nothing without control. I'm sure many of you have suffered from the drawbacks from working on a collaborative project, and for example, elements disappear. You cannot find the element because it's been created in the wrong work set. The entire codification of a parameter is wrong. Um, and this leads to my next image. This is Ben Parker saying to his nephew Peter Parker, aka Spider Man, with great power comes great responsibility. And if we're going to use the power of BIM, it is responsibility of all the people involved in a collaborative project to make proper use of it. So the information can flow fluently amongst all users and throughout all different phases of the project. And this involves having people who know how to use tools, who know how to work in a collaborative environment, who are aware of the BIM protocol in general, who follow the rules of the game. No? That's why we have BIM standards that dictate these rules and, and everybody must follow them if they want to work in collaborative. There must be a well-defined IT, hardware and software infrastructure, so everything is under control. A defined communication strategy between all agents involved based on a common data environment for documentation management, issue management, models delivery. And there must be a set of documents dictating these BIM standards, such as the BIM execution plan or the employee's information requirements, BIM implementation plan, or others like best practices manual, data strategy, and in general, everything that defines the standards to follow. But even though all this is well defined and everybody commits to it, doesn't mean it's gonna work well. We're human beings and errors can occur, and even more when there is many people with different backgrounds and from different companies working together. That's why we have to make quality control during all phases of the project. Here in the AC Beam protocol from the United Kingdom it specifies that the Responsibility of the BIM manager is to define the BIM standards and the BIM coordinator to audit and coordinate BIM models. This means the BIM manager is going to define what's acceptable or not, and the BIM coordinator will review the models looking for the non-acceptable things. However, I hope we agree that this does not mean I can work deliberately on my project without reviewing my own work, because somebody else will do that. Quality control is responsibility of every single collaborator in the project if we want it to be successful. And there are many ways of performing quality control. Some tools that can be used by the BIM coordinators or BIM managers, but some other tools that could be used by everybody. So, 
Today we're going to show you uh, some of these tools we use at Morelical and how we use them. First tool we have to make quality control are our own eyes to make a visual control of our work. That's why we always recommend and encourage not to work with a single window, but at least with three windows, with three different points of view, in order to check that the position of the elements in the three axes, and, and just to make a visual control to spot possible issues in the design. No? Second tool you can use is the Autodesk Model Checker. It's a useful tool that you can use from version 2018, I think, and on. You can download it from the Autodesk BIM Interoperability Tools portal, which is in the link below. And it allows to make a series of checks on Revit models, such as how many warnings do we have. It makes a list of all line styles, object styles, design options. It can list generic models, groups, in-place families, and highlights views that are not placed in sheets, or views with hidden elements, and many more. There are many videos on that address over there, so uh, we encourage you to take a look at it. Another tool is the Clash Detective from Revit. If uh, I'm sure many of you know about it, but probably some people didn't know there is a Clash Detective in Revit Integrated. Um, in the BIM context, Clash Detection, as we all know, is related to finding collisions between elements by automatic means. And with this way, we avoid uh, construction issues on field during the, during the design and pre-construction. We avoid these issues during the construction. There are three types of clashes. The hard clashes are those referring to objects interfering in the same space. There are soft clashes that refers to objects that interfere with the clearance space from other objects. This means that that space could be used for operation, for safety reasons, for maintenance, and if there is another object interfering in that space, that's called a soft clash. And there are other type of clashes called gray clashes, also known as 4D clashes. And these are related to scheduling and to delivery clashes um, related to project timeline issues. So uh, Revit has a very simple clash detector integrated in the Collaborate tab called Interference Check. Um, it allows to make hard clashes in between elements from your model and or from linked files. And it exports a report in an HTML uh, format. Simple tool, but useful. The next tool to make quality control is Navisworks. I'm sure most of you know about the power of this tool uh, to detect clashes by automatic means. I'm not going to take time to explain all its capabilities. Instead of that, today Andres will be showing you on a demo how we make clashes using this tool. Um, if there is people not seeing anything, we recommend you to download the Adobe Connect app instead of uh, watching you uh, uh, instead of watching the webinar on the web. Okay. If Gonzalo can answer on the chat, um, he will indicate you how to do that. Um, what else? Dynamo. Dynamo is a powerful tool that allows you to program all kinds of functionalities. Therefore, it can be used as a quality control tool too, as well. And today, Andres will show you how we use Dynamo together with Navisworks to locate interferences in the Revit models. Then we have quality control using rules. And there is a powerful software called Solibri. And 
quality control using rules goes beyond the classic clash detection since it allows to control the beam models using a large number of rules with multiple parameters. It allows to make clash detection plus data verification, verify compliance with the guidelines, verify egress routes, construction safety, um, construction site safety. It allows to compare model versions and many more. Today I will be showing you uh, on a demo how we use this tool uh, for making quality control by using rules. Next one, the VCF manager from Beam Collab is a very useful tool that allows to create and manage VCF files. VCF stands for Beam Collaboration Format. It's a file format that contains graphical, numerical, textual information about issues, no? And it's, it's suited for, for tracking and managing the, the issues in BIM. These files can be created by uh, any of these quality control softwares we have seen, such as Navisworks or Solibri, and they can be synchronized into an uh, issue management portal, such as BIM Collab, that it's in the cloud. So the BCF manager has extensions for different bit platforms, such as Revit, Navisworks, Archicad, Tegla, many more. And it allows to synchronize the issues from the portal, in this case, BIM Collab, into the uh, BIM platforms. So I can locate uh, the issues that have been created in a BCF format. I can locate these issues in my BIM platform, such as Revit. Today, we will be showing you how it works. And finally, Baywatch is a software we have developed here at Modelical, and it allows to perform quality control tests on BIM models by automatic means, without having to open them. This means that Baywatch will open all the BIM models overnight and perform a series of tests on them and extract the information. It will export this information uh, from the tests to a web, pl uh, web platform from Modelical that it's called modelical.io and it will drop all this information in a friendly interface that will allow you to, to check the quality of the models through different graphics and charts and, and Andres will we'll show you how it works in 2D later on. And with this, we are finished with the introduction and uh, we can jump into the live demos. So Andres, if you want to take it from here. Yes, thank you. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. I believe you're seeing Navisworks now. Yeah. So um, yeah, as, as Nacho mentioned, uh, Navisworks uh, would be one of the first tools we can use. Uh, it's very powerful to find these uh, hard clashes. Okay, so that means uh, elements overlapping each other, so the geometry is intersecting. And uh, Navisworks is part of the um, Autodesk uh, suite. So uh, if you have a Revit license, you most likely have a, a Navisworks too. Uh, so it's a good uh, tool to start uh, performing these uh, clashes, also because as it is also part of the Autodesk family, the, the, the interface can it's, it's, it's familiar. It's, it, it can be quite similar to Revit. So um, as you see here, we have a, a sample file with uh, the architecture uh, model and the structural model we've exported from Revit. And I'm just going to add the, the missing one. It's the NWC file, OK? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to add the MEP file. And you'll see this, this works as links to this NWC file. We'll see later why this is important. Um, and to perform these clash detections, we'll, we'll use the clash detective tool, uh, which brings up this panel. But um, first, we're going to define which kind of elements we're going to uh, look for uh, these clashes. Um, in this case, we've prepared uh, two search sets. Okay, so the first one would be 
str structural framing, we are looking in the structural file for all elements which with the category structural framing. Okay, so you see they've been selected here. Uh, we could uh, isolate them in this model. And we'll do the same for uh, MEP ducts in this case. Okay, so uh, again, we're looking for ducts and also duct fittings. Uh, we're going to say we're looking into this MEP model. Okay, so find all. Uh, and again, we've found all our ducts in our model. Um, so I'm just going to update this search set. Okay, I'm, because I just told you to look into this file. So now every time the, the files are updated and we re-export, uh, this, this will perform the search every time. So it's, it's, it will find new ducts that have been added to the model or new uh, beams. So we just have to do this part once. And then the, once this is ready, we can create our first uh, clash test. Okay, so in this case, uh, as we said, we're looking for clashes between structural framing uh, and MEP ducts. Okay, so we're gonna use uh, the sets we've prepared. Okay, so on first on the left uh, side we're gonna select the structural framing, right side for MEP ducts. Um, you see here we, we have different types of um, clashes we can look for. In this case we're looking for these hard clashes as we mentioned and we can also set the tolerance. So in early stages of the, the project, we can, we can increase this tolerance. So, you know, we, as we go developing the project, we can go further into detail, but uh, well, in this case, five centimeters will, will work for us. So we're just ready to run this test. And we can see we have already some clashes that have been found between these uh, ducts in green, okay, uh, and the beams in red. We can look at all of them at once. We have, we see we have six of them. Um, we can just look at them individually too. Um, and then we can already start uh, classifying and organizing these clashes. So in this case, six is not so many, but uh, we had a really long list. Uh, having some classification will, will, will help us. So um, for example, this is, this might not be the best example, but imagine we don't consider these two be a clash for whatever reason. So we can already approve it here. Okay, so we know it's one uh, class less we have to take care of. Um, and then we could also group clashes uh, to treat them as, as one. If that would make things easier for us. Um, so for example, if I imagine I could select this beam and then filter all these, all the issues that are clashing with this beam. Okay, so I could consider everything that clashes with this beam. I'm, I'm going to consider them uh, in one group. So in this case, we, there's two of them, which we can uh, group. We can we could name this group to something that well, makes sense for us, uh, beam one for now. Um, so yeah, we can we can already perform some uh, classification. Uh, to help us communicate these issues uh, to the design teams. Okay, uh, so that's that's the next step. Uh, how we how do we communicate these these issues? Um, as we mentioned in the presentation, there's third-party plugins and, and different ways we can go about this. The BCF manager is uh, surely one of the most popular. Um, so we'll see it in in, in the Solibri sample. So for now. We're going to use a, a, a different approach, but BCF Manager would also work between Navisworks and, and Revit. Uh, in this case, we're going to um, st stay in, uh, within uh, like out-of-the-box tools. We're going to be using Dynamo to uh, transfer this uh, issue information to Revit. Okay, so um, from the report tab is where we can uh, create these reports, clash reports. Um, you can see there's uh, different properties we can uh, export. In this case, we're very interested in this item ID, which is the Revit ID. So this will help us uh, find these clashing elements in the model. Uh, we can indicate which uh, clashes we want to report. So in this case, the, we, we don't want to report the approved one. Okay, we already forgot about that one. 
Um, and, and we can see we can export uh, only the groups we've created or all only the individual clashes. In this case, we'll select everything and, and we'll see what happens. Um, so with this, we're ready to export our report, uh, which is, is, is going to be an HTML file. OK, it's right here. And if we open it, uh, let me bring it over here. You see we have our group, but also our individual clashes within this group. Uh, and then we have a column item one uh, would refer to the beams in the structural model, OK? Item two for the MEP ducts. Um, so this would be a very simple uh, example of a report. Um, there's different ways we can go about this, but uh, to take it back to Revit, for now we're going to uh, use uh, Excel. So we're going to copy this report in Excel, and we're going to make use of these uh, text to columns uh, function, OK, to just isolate the IDs we're interested in. So remember, we're looking at the MEP uh, elements. I'm just going to copy them to a clean sheet. Uh, and, and I'm going to save this file. And with this, we're ready to move back to Revit. OK? So we have our MEP model here. Um, if it's like this duct, uh, some familiar maybe already. Um, so we've prepared our file uh, to bring these clashes. We've created a project parameter in this case, OK? Uh, where um, it's applied to all categories. It's a yes, no parameter. So what we're going to do is uh, all those clashing parameters, we're going to uh, mark them with this parameter so we can identify them. OK, so you see um, this this one uh, has the parameter. It's not checked yet. But uh, we could use uh, Dynamo to automatically read this uh, list of IDs uh, and set this parameter. So just to go over the definition, it's quite simple. It's it's looking for the Excel file, uh, sheet one. Uh, we are looking at these IDs, finding all the all the unique ones, uh, selecting the elements in the model by by these IDs, and setting the mod clash parameter to yes. Okay, so yes, no. It's the same as one zero. So we're gonna uh, apply the, the the yes value to to these elements. So if we run this definition, it's done. We can see this duct already has this uh, parameter uh, checked. And from here again, it's 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 very open. Uh, whatever workflow what's works best for anyone. Um, just as an example, we've prepared two views. OK, so uh, first we're looking at the Revit uh, link of the structural model um, in 50% well, uh, transparency. And in this case, we're using a filter. So we are hiding all the elements that are not clashing. OK, so this might sound familiar from the Navisworks file. These were the clashing elements uh, we could we can clearly see how they're clashing with the beams, right? Um, but yeah, like that, we can go about it in different ways. Like uh, in this case, for example, we have much context information. So uh, we prepare another view where, uh, in this case, we're using uh, we, we we're seeing those uh, elements we were previously hiding, but the ones that are clashing, we are painting them red, so we can clearly see them. Okay. So um, well, just to uh, see the, the like the whole process, we're gonna uh, avoid this clash. Of course, in a real project, we would be more careful than this. But uh, we'll see how we can fix. Once we fix these uh, clashes, we can take them back to Navisworks. Okay. So I'm gonna go to this clean view from which I can uh, export my uh, file in NWC format. Um, I'm just going to close the, this file we had. Uh, otherwise, if we try to override the, uh, the link, we will get an error. But we, we, yeah, we can simply override this file. Okay. 
And um, yeah, so back in Navis Works, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this is performed. Sorry, you are not seeing this, well, this little window with the progress. Uh, MEP files usually take a bit longer just because of the large amount of elements we usually have. But it's still, it's, it's not uh, a really big, uh, it's not, it doesn't take so long. Um, so yeah, it's, we'll wait for this to finish. It shouldn't take much longer. Um, as you see, this is like a very basic workflow using uh, simple tools. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll have some time at the end of the webinar for questions if anything wasn't clear. And once this is ready, we'll see the result in Navisworks. Um, also, if you have any questions, you can uh, type, you can write them in the chat. We'll, we'll take a look and we'll leave them for the end. So I think this is ready now. Uh, we can just go back to Navisworks, open the our file again. Okay. And now we see we get a warning sign for this clash test because the model has changed. Okay, so it, it's telling us that there's there's been changes to the model, so uh, we might want to review these clashes. So yeah, we're gonna update it. And we see these three issues have been resolved. We, we, go, we go back to the results, we see this, uh, well, this, you see these two clashes and also the the group which is counting as one, so that's three resolved file uh, clashes. Uh, so we can automatically keep track of them. Uh, of course, the approve we didn't care about it, and the last remaining clash uh, has changed from new to active. So this is telling us that it's not um, a clash uh, that is new because of the, the latest uh, version of the file. Uh, but it's something we have already found that we haven't addressed yet, so it's kept there as active. So you see how we can, uh, you know, work over time, uh, you know, just re-exporting our, our files as we fix them. We, we can keep track of the evolution of our of our project. Uh, so yeah, I hope that was clear, and I'm gonna hand it back to Nacho. Okay, thank you. Can I? Have the screen, please, Andres. Yeah. Okay. I think it was very clear. Thank you very much. Now you should be seeing my screen and you should be seeing a BIM model in Revit. Um, I'm going to explain how we use, how we make quality control of BIM models in um, Solibri by using uh, parametric rules. Here um, we're going to be using this sample BIM model which is the new, new York, the new museum in New York by Sanaa Architects. And I'm opening, I'm opening first in Revit because um, Solibri only can import, it can only import IFC files. Therefore, um, the first step for making quality control in Solibri is to make a proper IFC export. So remember, this means having correct mapping Oops. having the correct mapping IFC mapping classes loaded and when we export modify your uh, settings in order uh, according to your needs no? um, here I have two additional buttons that they do not come by default in Revit this is because I have downloaded this IFC export for Revit from the SourceForge um, website. And it is very useful because it allows me to change all the settings and save this into a JSON file. For example, let's call it IFC export settings. Okay, so next time I want to export my IFC file, I can just come here and um, open this, this JSON file. Okay, but that's not why we use it. Um, I wanted to explain you this, this JSON file because for exporting IFC files, we use our own tool in Morelical. 
it's an IFC batch export called Bone Collector that allows me to export several uh, BIM models at, uh, at once. So I will add a new export. Export folder would be uh, desktop. And here I, down, I can upload the JSON file with all the settings of my export. And over here I can come and I can upload as many BIM models I want. In this way, it will uh, export all the IFCs at once instead of having to open model by model and exporting the IFC manual. Okay, so let's assume I have already exported my IFC files and let's jump into Revit, into Solibri, sorry. This is Solibri and here I have two IFC files from this uh, Revit model. This one is related to the architecture with the curtain walls and this one is related relates to the structure of the building. Okay. And um, I'm going to be doing a quality control using rules. What's a rule? Rule it's a series of conditions or requirements that will check the model and the model needs to comply with these requirements. If the model does not comply with these conditions, it will return a possible issue. No? Here I have my rule set containing all the rules I want to check. And now with this button, I will check the model and the program will start thinking and will start reviewing the model to check if it complies with those conditions. As you can see, it went very fast because it's a small model and we have many, uh, we have little few rules in this case. But we can see that some of them have been passed and some of them have some issues indicated through these um, red and yellow triangles. So let's see what we have checked over here. The first rule we were checking it was that formatting of models naming is consistent. This rule checks that the model names are in accordance with the BIM execution plan specifications. Okay? If I go to see the parameters of this rule, it says that the name of the files have to follow this format. Well, here I had two files, both of them follow that format. Therefore, the format is OK and the rule has been passed. That's why it says OK. Perfect. Next rule contains spaces between construction elements. This rule checks spaces and it checks that the geometry and the location is correct. It checks that the, that the space, as we know in Revit as room, it lies within walls, columns, it has a slab underneath. And it checks also that the uh, maximum allowed for an unallocated space is half a square meter. This means that if I have a space of half a square meter, this could be a shaft, for example, I don't need to put a room. But if it's bigger than that, it may require a room. And here in the results tab, we see that there are some issues, specifically 33 issues. If I click over here, it will isolate those issues. And it will indicate which rooms they do not have a space, a room. Okay, if I, I can go to each one of these issues and it will isolate that these are the rooms not having a uh, space. If I go check the spaces in this model, well, maybe I can see that this is because these spacers are an elevator shaft and I didn't have to put a room over here. So what I could do is accept this, meaning that this does not represent uh, an issue because all these rooms, all these spaces did not require a room since the, it, this is the elevator shaft. Okay. Next one. Rooms have the right parameters. Okay, let's see what this rule is checking. 
usually mm -hmm. is checking that the exhibition spaces they must have the properties this means the parameters in Revit name and number field and it indicates that we have passed this rule okay let's see um, let's see the spaces in this model if I go and I select each of these spaces under the property sets identity data I have these two parameters name and number and they have a value so this is correct and if I go checking the different spaces in the model I will see that they all have these two parameters filled therefore the rule is okay and it has passed next rule certain rooms must contain required elements this rule is checking that the exterior spaces must have at least one piece of furniture minimum one and a maximum of 30 pieces of furniture let's see what we have over here this exterior space it's highlighting an issue and it's saying that too many furniture components specifically 35 which is more than 30 this is because I have uh, five tables with six chairs per table therefore I have 35 pieces of, of furniture this is bigger than the maximum allowed 30 and it highlights an issue over here and on the other hand um, I have another space that says that no furniture components it has zero furniture components therefore it's less than the minimum allowed one and it's highlighting an issue over here next rule components above pillars this rule is checking that each column touches slabs or a roof or columns so basically that the column needs to touch something above and we can see here it has highlighted it has spotted some columns if we zoom in it's not touching this lab above therefore there is an issue over here next rule for example is free space in front of doors okay, so over here we can see that it's highlighting we have sorry we have a chair on the way of the door this could mean that the, the door could not operate or there is no not enough clearance to access this door and it's indicating the dimensions of this soft clutch therefore there is an issue over here another issue it's highlighting that there is this ceiling this suspended ceiling in the way of the door this is because as we can see the height of the ceiling is not correct therefore we have another issue over here and another issue is that there is a door interfering with a wall this is a bigger problem than having something on the in, in the clearance of the door this is a collision between two elements therefore the correct rule to check this issue would be the next one we're going to see over here collisions with doors this rule it's it's checking that doors and um, are, are uh, colliding and interfering with any other element and here it's it's saying that yeah definitely we have a door that it's interfering with a wall why I'm uh, I am explaining these two rules this is to explain you the gatekeeper rules it's, uh, it's uh, more complicated therefore with these two rules it will allow it will allow me to, to explain it better um, since I don't I want to check the free space in front of the doors but I don't want to check these kind of issues meaning doors that are colliding with a wall I will use first the collision with doors and only for those elements that pass this rule meaning this 
door is not passing this rule, I will check the second rule, which is free space in front of the doors. So over here, if we see, I have passed this rule first. This door didn't pass this rule. And now I am checking this second rule, the free space in front of doors. And over here, I have the suspended ceiling that was on the wrong height. And I have the chair in front of the door. But I do not have the door that was interfering with the wall. That's the way we use the gatekeeper rules and it's a very useful tool to filter the kind of issues we want to track. Okay. And if I have explained myself uh, well enough, now we will see how we communicate these issues. Um, in order to communicate an issue, let's take this one, for example, I have to make what it's called a slide. Slide, it contains some graphical, textual, numerical information about the issue. Over here in the communication tab, I already created a slide with more information about this issue related to the suspended ceiling. And this uh, Solibri, it's uh, synchronized with the issue management portal BIM Collab. So through here, I will synchronize this issue with that portal. I have already done that in order to go faster. And if I go to my portal, BIM Collab, I have the issue over here. Okay, this is the issue I've taken from Solibri. Now this issue, it's a BCF file. I can open it in Revit through the BCF manager that we have explained earlier. Here, I have also synchronized my BCF manager with my um, BIM Collab portal. And I have the same issue I have encountered in Solibri over here. If I double click over here, it will isolate the issue in Revit. And as Andres did earlier with his clash in Navisworks, I'm going to amend this suspended ceiling. I should place it in the correct height. And last thing. I would need to do would be to come over here, edit issue, and I could say resolve or resolve and close. When I synchronize again with my BIM Collab portal, it will show over there that this issue has been resolved and closed. And we can move forward to the next one. Okay, with this, I'm done with the demo about uh, quality control using rules. And Andres, I can hand it over to you. Great. So I, I believe you're uh, seeing my screen now uh, with uh, Baywatch. Um, so yes, uh, Nacho mentioned and explained before um, uh, briefly, Baywatch is a, a tool we have developed in Modelical uh, that helps us, uh, we use it in our, our projects, especially the large ones with uh, many, many different models, um, because it, it, it allows us to, to keep track uh, of all the, all the models over time. This is more of a general uh, um, health checkup, we could say. Uh, we can see what's, what's going on in, the, in, in our models. Uh, so there's uh, three parts to it. The first one uh, would be a Revit add-in, uh, which we can uh, configure to uh, open a set of models uh, at a determined time. We usually do it uh, late at night. Um, and open these models, automatically extract information, uh, and then uh, take it to the second part of a watch, which would be this uh, web interface. Okay, so we can consume all this information uh, directly from a web browser from uh, anywhere without the need to open our model. So as you see, one of the first things we have is this analysis timeline, uh, where we can see we were performing uh, checks every day at 3 a.m., so uh, June 11, June 12. Again, we do this uh, 
to make sure everyone's done for the day and no one's working on the models anymore. Uh, and so we can have it ready uh, in the morning. So, uh, you know, the beam manager or beam coordinator can uh, start his day like reviewing uh, the general uh, status of the models. So uh, here we have a, a basic, basic example where we have uh, some tests uh, that we're running on these models. We have a, a, like a summary here showing um, the percentage of tests that are approved, the ones that are not, and also like a general score, uh, just as a super brief summary. But we also have this uh, project section here where we can see uh, the model we're looking at, the, the, the type of, well, the, the test, uh, and also the uh, value. So for example, in this first case, uh, it, it's a file size test. So basically we're checking for the file size, which is usually a requirement in, in most projects. In, in this case, we've set up a limit of, uh, well, this is in bytes, so 200 megabytes for an RPT file. Uh, this AR architecture model is 56 megabytes, so of course, this test is approved, accepted. Uh, we also have some other tests, like uh, this one. We don't want too many line patterns in our models because they take up uh, memory. Uh, so we've set up a, a limit, which in this case is over it. Uh, but we do not consider it to be a critical issue. So in this case, we take it as a, an accepted with comments uh, result. And we can provide a, a message uh, for whoever is reviewing this to, to know why uh, this is uh, wrong or a bit wrong in this case. Uh, and then some other tests, like this one is not accepted at all. Uh, so we don't want groups uh, in this project that we've said that we don't want groups in models. So uh, we have too many of them. Uh, it's not accepted. So we could, uh, you know, we could filter, for example, for a single rule, so we can uh, have a quick overview of all the models and, and what's their status, or we can uh, go straight to, to see where, where the problems are. Um, it's, it's very flexible, uh, and, and you know, it's a really quick overview of, uh, of the, the whole project when, when there are many models that uh, uh, make up this project. Um, we also have another type of uh, test over here, which is a report of how many elements there are in each war set. Uh, in, each case, in, in this case, we are, we're also including like uh, internal war sets, not user-created war sets. So uh, there's too many of them here now, but uh, we could also filter for these uh, um, user-created uh, war sets only. So you know, typical, we can look for how many elements uh, Structural elements are in an uh, architecture war set, which would be uh, a mistake, for example. Um, so this would be the general report, but we also have a series of uh, tabs here, uh, which show uh, a, a view of the model in uh, through time. Okay, so um, for example, uh, here this is the test for instance instances. So we can see how many instances there are in in each model. They are color coded over here. And you see we have a point for each of these analyses over time. So it's also a very visual way to try to identify problems. If we see the sudden spike in one of these graphics, we, we can suspect there's a, a problem. Um, and the, the tests are classified uh, in different tabs, uh, different groups. I like this one because it shows that uh, someone did a, a good job right, in uh, reducing the number of in-place families from uh, in this case, uh, 231 in June 6th to 0 in June 14. Okay, and we have one last type of uh, report, which is the warnings. We can classify them by type. So, um, so for example, wall overlapping walls. We can see how many of them are in, in each model, or we can also look at warnings per model. Okay, so we can see this architecture model uh, has too many warnings. Uh, this, this kind of graphics will, will give us an idea of uh, which models to tackle first. Um, so this will be like the base uh, kind of test we'll run, but uh, I can show you a different project. In this case, this is our office uh, in Madrid. Uh, and uh, we have some special tests. In this case, we also have a parameter report. So 
uh, for a series of parameters that are especially interesting for us. Uh, we want to review in this case either if they are uh, empty or not, or we can use in this case regular expressions to uh, to check if if the values of these parameters comply uh, with the values that we have established. So in this case, we're looking um, all the values for this mod beam ID parameter should be MMA followed by six digits. And we can see we have uh, well too many uh, elements that are not complying with uh, this rule. We can also look at um, parameters that are empty that, that should be uh, should have a value. Um, and just last thing uh, we wanted to show you today is a different kind of uh, information ex extraction. Uh, in this case, it's rooms. We can uh, this is the, the, all the rooms in the, in the model have been extracted and are shown here in this 3D view where we can uh, see the information. Uh, we can also uh, have like summaries and graphics of the area per department, uh, per name. Or uh, we can have a, a table of, of all the rooms uh, in our project uh, and also like different parameters. Um, and then all these tables can also be uh, exported uh, to an Excel file. So they could be incorporated into different uh, workflows in a company. I have extracted this, uh, uh, this table already. So I'm, I'm going to show you here. We get a, you know, a, a database of all our elements in our model and, and the parameters that are, we are interested in. Uh, so. In, in this case, with, in this project with uh, all these parameter tests, we, we could also think of other uses for Baywatch. It's not maybe a beam coordinator, but maybe a, a more uh, business uh, person who doesn't know about Revit, but still wants to know the, like the, the areas and, and spaces that are being developed in the project. Uh, so he doesn't need to open the models. He can just uh, access uh, Baywatch from any web browser and have this information. And then uh, I mentioned Baywatch has three parts. The third part would be uh, another add-in. So all these Excel files we are extracting, we could edit information uh, there, add uh, the values of the, the missing values of these parameters, and then all this information take it back automatically to the Revit model. So it would, again, overnight, the, the add-in would open these models, read the information from the, the Excel files and add the missing information to the elements in the models. But uh, uh, that was perhaps outside the, the scope of this webinar, and, and it's it's quite interesting. It would make for a webinar on its own. Uh, but uh, I hope you got like the general uh, sense of, of this tool. So I think this is everything we had prepared for you today. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Nacho. And I think we have some time for questions. OK. Yeah. Um, Andres, I think the first question here regarding, well, thank you very much. Uh, they're saying modelical.io is awesome. So thank you. Um, and Diego was asking, I can see the question over here. How long does it take this tool to collect all data? Well, and I was going, I was typing down. It really depends on how many models you are going to test, but it really doesn't matter because it's going to do it overnight. So, um, an, a machine will open all your beam models that you just need to allocate them in a Dropbox folder, for example. It will automatically open them all. It will play. It will make all these tests, and it will drop the information from these tests in the Modelical.io platform in this friendly interface and um, you will be able to check all this info in the morning so it really doesn't matter it, if it takes two hours six hours or eight hours because it's going to be done overnight no uh, andres if you have something to add yeah no that, that was that was it juan carlos Soledad, how long does it take to learn solibri rules setup i'm going to answer you to this question it can take a life. I mean, I've been using this program for, I don't know, um, 
four or five years and it, this is like the super mario bros uh, uh, 25 that you can never finish it so um it's very vast i mean you can there is a there is a um, a course in campus in the Modelical campus about Solibri and I think with that course you can learn how to use the program quite well but then the rules there are many rules and the combination of parameters are infinite so in the end you can check so many different things in inside the models that it can take a lifetime but that's what is good from the program and that's what also it's it encourages you it encourages you to learn more about it. Thank you, Narciso. I ho if you have seen it, thank you. I'm saying it because it's me who is do uh, who is doing it. So <laughs> I encourage you all to see it. <laughs> thank you, Narciso. Um, did you spot any other questions, Andres? No, I don't, I'm, um, no, no, I think Beam Collab has connection with Power BI. Do you know anything about that? We have an expert in Power BI in the office. You should ask him. I don't know if there's a direct connection, but um, from Beam Collab you can also extract uh, the issues in different formats. So uh, I believe if if you extract it in Excel, then from Power BI, you can also query that uh, Excel file. But there might be a direct connection. I'm not sure about that one. And Juan Carlos says he's waiting for Solibri part two. OK, that will come, uh, hopefully. But uh, it has to be as good as the Godfather too, because you know, second parts are never that good. So um, we, <laughs> I will, we will try to make a, a good one. And I saw a question earlier on also about uh, Juan Carlos. Okay, Modelical.io is open to the public via subscription or it's only for your use? Okay, it's not that it's only for our use. It's that we use it for uh, our projects because it basically comes from the need of doing several activities. For example, this uh, Baywatch tool came I don't know if it was particularly from a large scale project of a big stadium. It had 75 Revit models. So imagine if you have to control, you're the beam manager and you have to control these 75 Revit models with 200 people from 21 different subcontractor, subcontracting companies working on them. It's, it's a nightmare. And we developed this tool and the BIM manager could easily in the morning check throughout these charts and these graphics the evolution of the models. And whenever a model was going crazy, he could just go to the responsible of that model and highlight that there are these issues and these other issues. So it is basically a tool we use ourselves for our clients and that our clients use as well. But um, if you're interested in it, uh, feel free to contact us and we can show you. It has some other functionalities. We can show you what it does and, and let's see if, uh, if you want to use it. Um, Albert has added in the chat that there is a Beam Collab a Power BI connector. So. Thank you, Alberto. Um, regards from Costa Rica. OK, we're glad we are being seen from different parts of the world. Thank you, Michal, Taras. Um, glad you came. <laughs> OK. And um, yeah, thank you very much to all participants. Um, we are past seven. We intend not to take you more than one hour of your time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this webinar. Andres, you want to add anything? Yeah, no, thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, and have a good uh, evening, morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, have a good day. OK, here in the screen, you can see our uh, email addresses. So feel free to contact mm -hmm. us if you have further questions. 
And it's been a wonderful experience for us to share this knowledge with you. I hope you can make it to the next webinars. Uh, hopefully, we'll be coming soon. OK, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.